I want to read this poem again by Muhammad Darwish. It's a poem that is, um, I don't know, troubles me in some way, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what to say about it. It's a poem that creates a certain kind of atmosphere, like a weather, like the weather system, like the way a song creates a vibe. And it's certainly not a poem that I'm going to, uh, what should I say, explain. And rather just sort of let it, let it live. So here we go. Can you turn this one off? In Jerusalem, and I mean within the ancient walls, I walk from one epoch or epoch to another without a memory to guide me. The prophets over there are sharing the history of the holy, ascending to heaven and returning less discouraged and melancholy because love and peace are holy and, and are coming to town. I was walking down a slope and thinking to myself, how do the narrators disagree over what light said about a stone? It is from a dimly lit stone that wars flare up? I walk in my sleep. I, I stare in my sleep. I see no one behind me. I see no one ahead of me. All this light is for me. I walk. I become lighter. I fly and then become another transfigured. Words sprout like grass from Isaiah's messenger's mouth, Isaiah's messenger mouth. If you don't believe, you won't be safe. I walk as if I were another in my wound, a white biblical rose. And my hands like two doves on the cross, hovering and carrying the earth. I don't walk, I fly, I become another transfigured. No place and no time. So who am I? I am no I in Ascension's presence. I am no I in Ascension's presence. But I think to myself, alone, the Prophet Muhammad spoke classical Arabic. And then what? And then what? A woman soldier shouted, is that you again? Didn't I kill you? And I said, you killed me, and I forgot, like you, to die. I suppose this poem um, came to me because I was just there. I was just walking in the old city, and I was just in Jerusalem. And, and it's, there are funny lines in here, if, if you know the geography, when he says, I was walking down the hill. I mean because nothing is flat in, in the old city. You're walking up and down and up and down. And, and you go down to go up to the highest place. It's, it's, a, it's strange. And, um, and it raises the question, like being there, being there now in particular, was different because for some reason I planned this trip, you know, a year ago and I'm, can't believe that it even worked out with COVID. And so I was there with a group, and it was mostly empty, which is a very strange way to see Jerusalem. It's a very strange way. It hasn't been this empty since I first moved there in 2003 during the Second Intifada when there was a lot of fighting and just tourism just shut down completely. And so it felt like that. And, and it's also a living place. It's not a tourist attraction. It's not Disneyland. You know, like, oh, let's go see where Jesus did miracles, you know, or whatever. It's, it is that for some people, but it's a living place. People live there. People live in the old city. And there are soldiers shouting things and people buying vegetables. And So anyway, this poem is on my mind, and there's something about the ordinariness of it. And who's still there? Like, who's there? And who's there like the living, breathing fleshiness of people and the backdrop is all these sacred sites, you know. And 
what are they? You know, and <laughs> what, why are people still there? And, um, and, and so a question I wonder when I hear this poem, I don't know if he's being facetious or not um, about the ascending and descending, about his own ascent. I don't think he is. I think he's saying he's having a kind of spiritual experience or describing when, where the I disappears. You can hear it. He says, I am no I in ascension's presence. It's like, what do we mean by I? What is an individual? Who am I? He's asking. And it sort of dissipates for a minute. And it, it's like there's like an eternal presence that appears like a window. And then, and then the voice of the soldier, you know, didn't I kill you? You did, and like you, I forgot to die, and so here we are again. And um, it's a kind of resurrection poem, I might say. Like, the ordinary resurrects itself in, in the poem, I think. It's just another man in the city and, a, and another woman with a gun, you know. Anyway, I'm just describing the poem because it's impossible for me to explain. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. And we need more poems. We need to, to know more the feeling of not knowing what things mean. And um, So I went to see a couple friends while I was there. Like I said, I was leading a trip, and so there, my day is full of just walking around with people who have never been there before and thinking about what to say where and what we might discuss and what people might experience. And I went to see my, some of my friends in, at night when I was in Jerusalem, and one of them was saying how, how weird it was to live in Jerusalem over the last two years during COVID because he's a pastor, and part of his, part of his life, really, is the coming and going of people in the congregation that he's a part of, like international groups, Christian groups, um, Graduate students like me, that's, that's how we met. I was passing through in graduate school. And, and when people come to Israel, whether it's politically, for political reasons, they're pro-Israel, pro-Palestinian, or they want to involved in social justice things, or, or they're there to study, or they're there to feel like they want to be in the Holy Land or something like that, there's always a certain amount of energy with that. You know, just like if you go to Michigan Stadium to see a game, well, there's a certain kind of energy when people show up, and that just, like, evaporated. And it was back to life, you know, and lockdown. And lockdown was very difficult for, for the people who live in, in Israel. And, and, of course, the underbelly of, of bureaucracy shows itself, and... So he was kind of saying something like, it was like the specialness of this place just evaporated. It's like, oh, this sucks, you know? And, and it's often like that. I remember when I lived there and just trying to figure out how to pay bills. It's the most ridiculous, bureaucratic stupidity you've ever heard of. Nothing makes sense. You have to pay your, your electric bill at the post office. Why? Because nobody thought of a better system. It's stupid, and that's just one bill. You've got to pay the, the others other places, Anyway, so I started just thinking about and feeling into kind of the specialness, like what makes a place special and, and is it really not that special, you, you start to feel. Um, and he used a funny word when he was describing it. It was like the fantasy of Israel disappeared during COVID. I was like, oh, that's a funny way of putting it. And, I, I, and fantasy has a place. When I say fantasy, I don't mean... We should avoid fantasy, you know? I mean, Harry Potter is probably the, the best book of the century. We don't say, you know, really, honestly, you know? How did something like that get to be so successful? It's because we have a relationship with imagination and fantasy that we need. So. But it also evaporates, and, and, and you start to wonder what's real and what's not. And, that, and I, anyway, that was kind of rolling around in my mind. And once again, the question I keep asking, what makes a place sacred, you know? Is it a fantasy is it sacred at all, you know, a place like Israel? What makes special rooms or special buildings feel a certain way? And how much of that is fantasy? How much of that is projection? How much of that is real? And 
How do we relate to it? And meanwhile, where we're walking around the city having a special experience, someone might yell at us, what are you doing? Didn't I kill you? You know, it's just, it's a funny world that we live in. And, um, and uh, I was in the Holy Sepulchre. So the Holy Sepulchre is a church in Jerusalem. Sepulchre means tomb. And it was built by Helena. This is Constantine's mother in the 300s AD. So it's an old place. <laughs> And it's been around for a while. And she built kind of a magnificent church that mostly survives. It, it was expanded during the Crusader era, but it's a giant rotunda. And inside that rotunda is the place that commemorates the resurrection. And also in the same building, in another part of it, a place that uh, commemorates the crucifixion. And it's actually, from an archaeological point of view, not impossible like the, the, that this was the place where the crucifixion took place and where the tomb was and so forth. It's an interesting spot, and um, it's also, like my, my friend is a Palestinian Christian said, he's, he used to live in Italy, he's like, I've been to beautiful churches, and this is not one of them. <laughs> it's what I usually refer to it as a religious carnival. It's a hodgepodge. It's weird. It's messy. You don't know what's going on, you know, especially Protestant Americans who, you know, their version of church is like a couple songs and a sermon have no idea what's going on. Like, why are people walking around, and why are they wearing these weird clothes, and what is this incense, and why are people chanting, and why are some people waiting in line for things, and and who painted this, and what is this mosaic, and why are people rubbing oil on a stone? And I just say, just enjoy it, you know? Just enjoy the religious carnival. And it's, it's a strange place. And in 1757, something like that, actually that, exactly, um, the sultan, Ottoman, sultan announced there should be what he called the status quo. So Christians had been fighting inside the Holy Sepulcher about who gets to do what and when. Imagine that, Christians fighting about things. And so he said, enough. Everything is going to stay as it is, and we're going to call a timeout. All right, the status quo. So he said, timeout. I don't know if you really did like a timeout, but (laughs) that's how I think about it, timeout. And, and it worked. And about 100 years later, they had another, another conversation about it that involved, by the way, a war in Crimea, and it involved the Russians and the French and the Ottomans. You know, we think, we th- yeah, for things to be happening again in Crimea that are both religious and political involving the Russians, and it's like, okay, here we are again. So um, anyway, they announced again the status quo that sh- it should hold, and it's been that way ever since. And and the, so the church is ch- shared between six groups, and it's like the um, Ethiopian, Coptics, the Ethiopian, and the Ethiopians, the Coptics, the Armenians, the Greek Orthodox, the Syrian Orthodox, and the Catholics share the space. These represent all, they don't represent, they are also different cultures. They speak different languages, so imagine trying to do that, you know? So it's mostly held in. And the thing about the status quo is the great thing about it is that they're not, they're not murdering one another inside the sepulcher over religious stuff. They're just saying, we're still in the timeout. And they can't make any changes until all six groups agree. So guess what? <laughs> they never make any changes, you know? So there's something beautiful about it. It used to bother me, but there's something beautiful about it. And, and also it feels like things are frozen. And they feel strange, like... And you see things happening, and you're like, why is this happening? When I was there, it just happened to be the time where the Fran- it was the Franciscans' turn to go inside the tomb, and they went in there, and they have their little incense things, and they come in. And, and of course, the Franciscans, they've got the organ, and, and um, it's very Catholic, you know, the, the liturgy, and they go in, and they did their, their special thing, and then they came out. Um, and then as soon as they were done, then the Greek Orthodox had to go in, and then they had to cleanse the tomb with their incense, <laughs> And then the Armenians had to come in and they had to cleanse the tomb with their incense. And then later on, it would be their turn to do something different. And it's just funny to witness this. And the thought that occurred to me was that was strange. I was like, this was going on when no one was allowed in the sepulcher because of COVID. Just think about that for a moment. It's not a show, you know? They're mostly annoyed that tourists are there. You know, they have them blocked off. You know, it's our turn and they block everybody off and you have to stand behind these little rails and It's just like, how interesting, how do we get here, and what is it that we're commemorating or remembering here? And and the fact that it just goes on, it would go on forever whether anybody went or not. 
I don't really have a thought about that. Or a, I just say, I just, it's, like, it's just strange. It's a strange thing. Um, and I, I start to wonder, I was starting to wonder, like, just about the state of religion, period, the state of Christianity. It's like things feel frozen sometimes. Why are we doing these things? And for how long? And, and is that good? Is it bad? Or is it neither? maybe neither good or bad are the right categories? And, and sometimes I feel like maybe the next generation is like, Whatever you guys are doing, fine, but they've just left the building altogether. <laughs> Maybe they've heard about it, but other than that, they're just... And, it's, and so it's like Christianity is in a weird spot. Religion is in a weird spot. And, and there's a lot, of emf- a lot of effort to keep things the same. And sometimes the sameness feels like a death. Like it's, I might say something like that. Um, here's another thought. I had a lot of things that were kind of stirring in me as I got to walk around with other people on a pilgrimage. Like I said, it was a bit strange to see Jerusalem so empty and, um, and to see ceremonies with no one around. And, and, it, and, it, and it struck me also funny, too, that they go inside the tomb and people wait in line to go inside the tomb. And you know what's inside the tomb? Nothing. <laughs> but that's actually the point of Christianity, you know? Like, <laughs> is Jesus here? No, that's what, we, we, that's what we're saying. He's not. <laughs> he left. <laughs> I'm not even saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm not even mocking it. I'm just saying it's just that's a funny reality that inside is emptiness. And, um, and that reminded me of, of, of how the biblical tradition really the Hebrew tradition, the Hebrew religion, birthed that idea in the first place, that you're not supposed to make a graven image, which which is a way of, of hovering around emptiness. Like, where is God? You know what you, you have to say if you're like trying to be biblically literate or biblically, uh, what's, what's better than literate? Biblically um, literal, you could say. <laughs> you would say we, we say, we don't know. Like, we don't know what God looks like. We can't imagine it. We're not allowed to imagine it. If you go inside the Holy of Holies, so to speak, you know what's in there? Nothing. Nothing. Or emptiness, you could say, a kind of abyss. So I I think that's intriguing to me. So like we wait in line, or some people wait in line, and you go in, and it's like, here we are, and it's like, nothing's here. And I'm not saying nothing is nothing. Nothing is something. It's just a strange kind of something. It's a strange kind of, I know I'm speaking in paradoxes, but um, I love this idea. And um, I decided on this trip that I was going to go to places I haven't been in a long time. Because why? Because I was in charge of the trip. I can do what I wanted. And I decided to go to sites I hadn't been to in a while just to see them. And I went to a place called Dan. And uh, Dan is way up north in, in Israel. I'm going to give you a little biblical history here, just the drive through version. And um, you don't have to remember these names, but you can imagine the concept. So you, the, the tribes of Israel are united under King David. Everybody's heard of him. And then it's Solomon, his son, is very cruel, actually. And the people are quite fed up. And once Solomon dies, the, the kingdom is split between the northern tribes and the southern tribes. They just divide. And the king in the north, his name is Rehoboam, starts to get nervous. He's like, well, I've got these tribes, but I don't want them going down to the southern kingdom, run by a guy named Rehoboam. Jeroboam, I get them confused. Rehoboam, I think, runs the southern kingdom, because that's where Jerusalem is. And so the people are going to have split loyalty. I might be the king up here, but they're going to go somewhere else to church, or they didn't call it that, but you know what I mean. They're going to go somewhere else. They'll all be drawn to Jerusalem. So he's like, that's not a good idea. So he builds his own temple in Dan, and one other in another place, and and he says, okay, I want the, my people to come and worship in, in my spot. And you can go to Dan, and you can see the, the altar there and the steps. And it's quite, you know, this is a 3,000-year-old temple. It's, it's impressive. It's amazing. And um, in the story, it says that Jeroboam makes a golden calf and says, here's your God that, you know, brought you out of Egypt, and you should come here to worship. Now, 
What's the problem with that as an idea? I mean, you don't have to necessarily answer, but just think about it. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is the book of Exodus. That's what Moses, you know, Moses goes up, gets the Ten Commandments. One of them says, make no graven image. He comes down, and what have they made? A golden calf. And he gets mad, and he smashes the the tablets, and he grinds it up and makes the people drink it. Why is the king up north saying, I got an idea. How about a golden calf? (laughs) Now, kings aren't stupid. He knows it's going to work. He doesn't think it's not going to work. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like you wouldn't say, hey, I'm going to make something that everyone's going to turn away from. Obviously, he's going to make something that people are attracted to. That's what he wants. He wants to, to, to bring political and social, he wants to consolidate political, religious, and social power by setting up a golden calf. So. But here's where you need to know a little Hebrew. Because if you read it in English, the story will say, here are your gods. Right? Here are your gods. Here's your golden calf, and here are your gods. And every American thinks, I can't believe they're worshiping other gods. You know? but that's not what it says. <laughs> it says, here's Elohim. That's interesting. That's the word, here's Elohim. Elohim is one of the names of God. I know I, it's a plural word, but he's saying, here is Elohim in the image of a golden calf. And where did he get that idea? From the book of Exodus. Because Aaron says the same thing when he sets up the golden calf. He says, this is Elohim. Who brought you out of Egypt? And the people say, yeah, that makes sense to us. Now, why am I telling you that? Because the Bible is interested in emptiness. Whatever we mean by God is interested in emptiness. It gets annoyed at defining the divine in concrete terms. Even if it's the God of Israel, Elohim. Here's Elohim, a little tiny golden calf. They were small, by the way. They found a found a bunch in excavations. Like, you can go to the Israel Museum and see a calf, and it's about this big. <laughs> you, know, like, you think, well, that's, you know, maybe a little bigger, you know? I mean, <laughs> but it doesn't matter because it's like saying we need an image. We need to associate the divine with something, if, and if not, we're going to feel that emptiness. So we want to fill that space with something. And that's what I think, I think is the genius. Like the, it's like a kind of a spiritual, a psychological genius hidden inside the biblical story saying, you can never get that close. It's all emptiness. It's all out of reach. The mystery is just that. And I was starting to feel that again in the sepulcher around these traditions and all this pomp and circumstance and status quo, and, and there's nothing in there. It's a strange, it was a strange feeling to me. Okay, I've got one more path I want to go down. A friend of mine asked me to do a talk, which I've been putting off. He wants me to do it for his church. And um, he said, I want you to do a talk, and the title of it is, um, Do I Believe in God? <laughs> I was like, dang it. All right. How much are you going to pay me? (laughs) Because I I like to avoid this question. Because it feels like to me something like this. To say I believe in God or to say I don't believe in God still feels like a kind of act of will, like a faith, really, like, Oh, I definitely, I definitely don't believe in God, or I definitely do believe in God. So there's like an element of faith that involves both. And, and also it makes me uncomfortable because it's like, what's a belief, you know? And what does it even matter? Do you know how many people say they believe in things and they just live in a completely different way? So what's the point? And so lately, the last 10 years, I've mainly said something like, it's not a very important question. But now it feels like an important question, but in a different way. So I've been thinking about it. I still haven't given the talk yet, <laughs> but I will. And, um, and something is starting to change for me. Like, I, I tend to think that, that the question of belief in God has something to do with desire. That's the way I would put it. And, and I would put it this way, if I can just be personal. I, like, there is a desire that's present in me for the transcendent, for the mystery. Like the desire is present. 
It's like, I don't, it doesn't matter to me if there's a belief or not a belief. The desire is present. So I, how can I put it? Um, that, that the desire for the transcendent, for the mystery, for the unknown, is in fact what, how I would define belief. That's the way to put it. So do I believe? Well, I, the desire is present. And so as much as a desire is a belief, yes, I do. Even though I have a hard time saying in a sentence, I believe in God. I just say the desire is present and I trust the desire. I do, I trust the desire. Because how would I define that? The desire to be concerned about things of ultimate concern. <laughs> are you concerned about things that are of ultimate concern? Yeah, I hope so. And the great thing about that is that we don't often know what the things are that are of ultimate concern, correct? That something could feel like it's of ultimate concern, and then it can shift the way the wind suddenly shifts. And you're like, wait a minute. I was concerned about something I thought was of ultimate concern. Turns out it wasn't of ultimate concern, which is another way of saying something else than it was of ultimate concern. So the, I think the desire is present. So whether or not God exists, I don't know. He hasn't or she hasn't told me about that unless the desire itself is the telling. It's, it awakens a kind of opening. I know I really haven't said much of anything without speaking in poems and riddles. I'm just admitting that. Because once you go inside the inner rooms, it's empty in there. There's an abyss in there. I was with a friend of mine. I'm almost done. I was with a friend of mine in Israel. He's a pastor from Denver, and um, we were kind of co-leading. And he's brought, this I think is his third group over, which I'm really grateful for. And we were ending the trip, and ordinarily people come to the Mount of Olives, which is next to Jerusalem, and they, they kind of recapitulate the entering of Jesus into Jerusalem, and they, you're on the Mount of Olives, and they walk down and into the city. It's kind of this thing, and I don't know why, it was kind of a logistical thing. There was also the Jerusalem Marathon happening, and I had to, like, adjust things, and, which is always, like, it, there's always something wrong and going wrong. You can never plan. So I kind of enjoy that. So I did it in reverse order, and I said, the last thing we're going to do is ascend the Mount of Olives. And uh, so that's what we did, and, and he remembered as we were walking up, he's like, you know what? There's the story of the ascension of Jesus, and I'll read that at the top, and we'll end the, we'll end the trip that way. He's like, great, do that. So we get to the top, and he reads the ascension story, and this was in the Ascension story, and I swear, I've read the Bible before, but every time I hear something, I think, I've never heard that before, you know? And it says this, Jesus ascends, and it said, many believed and some doubted. That's the way the book ends. That's, that's odd. That's, and, and he said, he said, that's, that's an odd, that's like kind of not very good propaganda, you know? Like, <laughs> he ascended, and some people doubted, like, that's weird. That tells you that there's probably some authenticity to this story. You don't slip in that a lot of people didn't believe this unless a lot of people didn't believe this. And I started thinking that doubt and what I'm calling belief, now, now I've, I'm giving, giving it the nuance of desire, are like lovers. They hold hands. They're, they're one in the same. It's like, I, that's an image of, my, of the inner rooms of my own heart. I believe in the sense of I have a desire for the transcendent and of things of ultimate concern, and I doubt at the same time, you know? And I think, when will that go away? I don't think it's going to go away. I think that, for me, that's what being a person of faith is like. It's just carrying these tensions in the inner rooms of one's own being. So I've got two questions and I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail. I just wonder what it would be like for you, for you to wrestle with the question again. Do I believe in God? What do I mean by that? And so that's one. And here's another question. What is my actual experience of my own life right now? What is my actual experience, otherwise known as God, but what is my actual experience? Something was very different on this pilgrimage. I've done Dozens and dozens of these. 
And you know what the number one question to me as I was walking around was not like, what happened where? Do I remember the dates? And the status quo started in 1757, and, and you know, the Babylonians sacked the temple in eight, uh, 586 BC, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? You know what my number one question was for people on the trip? What's happening for you? That's all, that's all I was interested in. What is actually happening? What is the nature of my own experience? What am I thinking and feeling and sensing and imagining and questioning and wondering about and doubting and what's, what's the desire? Do you believe in God? What is your actual experience of your own life like? Is it possible to tune back into that? And I have four more, but I'm not going to say them. Those are the two questions I'm interested in right now. Thanks for listening.